Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Brett Milford, and today I will be talking about optimizing resource allocation in hyperconverged infrastructure. I'm going to provide an overview of the main categories of infrastructure architecture and some key considerations that you should think about when employing hyperconverged architecture. Then we'll take a look at a few case studies that exemplify these considerations. And to round out the talk, I'll briefly cover some tools and methods for interrogating these issues. And uh, we'll also provide an overview of the various controls at your disposal to manage the allocation of resources in your systems. This will be by no means be an exhaustive look at the issue. In fact, I would have liked to have covered a few more topics in depth. Um, however, this talk should provide a good cross section uh, of the topic and um, hopefully you can apply these ideas to, to some other areas where you encounter these issues. Uh, a little bit about me, I'm a software engineer for Canonical uh, within the sustaining engineering team. Uh, sustaining engineering provides L3 break fix support to Canonical's customers and as such we maintain a team with broad and deep expertise of uh, all the software that we support, so that's like OpenStack and server applications like MySQL, um, right down to the Linux kernel. And uh, with this role and previous roles that I've been in, I've been an enthusiastic user of OpenStack since 2016. In fact, in preparing this talk, I was going back through my archive of uh, old notes from when I was an operator, and I found an upgrade plan for OpenStack Metaka from uh, early 2017, so that was a, a fun trip. So, uh, as I mentioned, Canonical supports numerous OpenStack clouds at scale, uh, with Ubuntu being the foremost distribution underpinning OpenStack deployments. Sustaining so Engineering provides L3 break fix support, and our unique position in the organization as a catch-all affords us the opportunity to dive deep into really interesting problems and topics. Um, yeah, so managing the uh, breadth of applications required for a cloud and their resources is a complicated matter at the best of times, uh, but it's particularly difficult in a hyperconverged in hyperconverged architectures. So applications competing for resources can create compounding effects on resource starvation, or alternatively, due to the vast interplay of applications and configurations, and despite available resources, you can encounter edge cases where they just simply don't work. So this is the area I'll be focusing in a bit more in this afternoon's presentation. So I'm going to give you a brief overview of types of infrastructure architecture and um, I suppose roughly how they relate to Charmed OpenStack. Um, firstly, we have the disaggregated architecture. This is where all your components like compute, network, storage, and control plane, they're all hosted on separate nodes. This allows the logical separation of applications by workload and hardware requirements, and it also allows the separation of user and system workloads. Uh, this also cleanly accommodates mixing hardware and software components, for instance, like having uh, dedicated network or storage appliances in the mix. Next, we have the converged architecture. And here, one type of node hosts the control plane components, while another type of node hosts the storage and, work and compute workloads. Uh, this still permits system and user workloads, but it combines some of the functions and requirements from the previous architecture. Then we have hyperconverged. This is where all the functions, compute, network, storage, and control plane, are distributed across all the nodes of the cloud. These applications might be logically separated with containerization. So in the instance, in, for instance, in Charmed OpenStack, we make heavy use of LXD containers. Uh, this is typically a sought after choice for general purpose workloads in order to maximize flexibility and utilization uh, of cloud infrastructure. And uh, these three architectures, they generally serve as a talking point for design and implementation. However, in reality, um, you know, hardware and software components and converged and disaggregated nodes are common in many clouds. And in the near future, there might even be like a fourth architecture that might emerge when we see like the proliferation of uh, DPUs, for instance. So when you're analyzing hyperconverged architecture, or infrastructure, I should say, um, there's a few things you should think about. Um, it's unique because you need to be aware of the many uh, software components simultaneously and their characteristics and their interactions. So some key facts to, that is good together when you're working with hyperconverged infrastructure are the per host application layout, including the kernel, the OS, and key system functions or applications that are running on a given node. It's worth noting that there might be a number of combinations in a hyperconverged setup, i.e. you might have one node that hosts Nova Compute, a Cephmon, and MySQL, and another node that hosts Nova Compute, a CephOSD, and RabbitMQ. It's uh, useful to be aware of this, and in some instances, 
in instances, it's helpful to generate a service map. So this map can be useful in narrowing down issues, ruling out specific services or layers, or focusing in on the interaction between two particular applications. So for instance, if you have an issue and it's reproducible across a range of nodes or a subset of nodes um, with different service maps, you can probably use that to help rule out certain applications and the interactions uh, or focus in on the interactions between one or two applications. Um, some other key considerations are you might need to make common denominator configuration choices when you're working uh, with hub conversion infrastructure unless your cluster is set up to manage the complexity of a heterogeneous cluster. And um, as a matter of uh, planning, you should uh, generally separate user workloads and system workloads concern and, and their concerns when you're like modeling your requirements. So I would generally start by analyzing the control plane, network and storage requirements first before I then uh, add in user workload concerns into a problem. Um, and a couple of more things that's always useful to uh, think about is when you're looking at an application and its requirements, you should think, uh, how does it scale? Does it scale with user workload? Um, and what's the relationship there? So we're now going to take a look at some case studies to help elucidate the methodology I outlined. The first uh, case study that I have is a Ceph file store issue that um, it's not super uncommon. In fact, you've met, if you're avid users of Ceph, you probably have already encountered this in the past. Um, the first issue, uh, the user prevented, uh, presented with Inamin kernel panics on their um, systems and a lot of demessage uh, kernel hung, demessage uh, messages with uh, kernel hung tasks, which look like info task blah, blocked for more than 120 seconds. Uh, the software stack they were using is Ubuntu 14.04. Uh, there was a 4.4 kernel and it was uh, Ceph Dual. The output of their free memory looked like this. So as you can see, there's sufficient free memory, uh, but the excess of that memory is being used for cache. So what's the application or what is the application behavior of Ceph file store? Well, the OSDs are implemented on top of a common file system, in this case XFS, and the OSDs make use of the page cache buffer for reads and writes. Dirty uh, pages are flushed frequently to disk, and clean pages fill the page cache, and they might linger if they're never invalidated. This is uh, demonstrated in the output of proc zone, or proc mem info, sorry. Um, so what's the problem here? Well, reclaim needs to take place to be able to use that memory that's currently being used for the cache. Uh, sometimes direct reclaim needs to happen at inconvenient times to satisfy a memory allocation request. We can't directly set a point at which KSwapD wakes up and performs an asynchronous reclaim, but we can see when it will. So, yeah, that's right. Looking, oh no, so that is in mem info. <laughs> but if we look at proc zone info, um, we have these uh, watermark values. So when free pages drop below the high watermark, asynchronous reclaim takes place until at least high number of pages is are free. And when the value drops below the low watermark an allocation, and an allocation is requested, direct reclaim takes place and the allocation is stalled until enough memory is free to satisfy that allocation. So what can we do about this? Well, uh, on Linux 4.4, not a lot. Um, there are values that you can set, uh, sorry, the values in uh, the previous slide actually uh, were set as multiples of min free k bytes. Um, so we could raise this value, and then KSwapD would wake up earlier to reclaim, um, reclaim the, uh, the cached data. Or the second option is to manually um, drop and compact memory. And that's what uh, we did in this circumstance. Um, yeah, so a second case study that I want to look at is a Swift on XFS issue. Um, so in this circumstance, the user presented with the following issue. Their reads and writes to their Swift cluster were failing at a high rate with uh, 503 service unavailable. So it wasn't a complete outage, but it was a severe degradation of service. Uh, their software stack was Ubuntu 14.04, a 4.4 kernel, XFS, and Swift Mataka. So in investigating this issue, we found a large number of container database, uh, sorry, we found large container databases. Um, the container database replicator was producing a high number of quarantined files, and the replication of these container databases were failing in a number of ways. So 
Uh, one of them included uh, lock timeouts when trying to replicate databases, and there was also various database error leading to quarantine database files, similar to the ones listed there. We also witnessed a couple of XFS-related errors. So how does the Swift container database replication take place? Well, when replication takes place under the hood, Swift will sync batches of rows of um, the container databases when the difference between the databases is small. Uh, when the difference between the databases is large, it'll rsync the entire database and basically like drop it in place. So these databases were quite large. They were 25 gig each, and there is actually, I don't know, there was many, 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 many copies of this spread throughout the entire Swift cluster. And so Swift wanted to try and replicate those piece by piece, basically. Um, and under these conditions, it just was unable to complete. So additional analysis of uh, this infrastructure, we noted that there was like high levels of memory fragmentation as demonstrated by a lack of higher order pages. Um, yeah, and analyzing the memory usage further, there was around 11.8 gigs of anonymous memory usage, 32.3 gigs of file memory usage, and the total reclaimable memory was about 52 gigs. So reclaim should have been possible, but it was clear it wasn't happening soon enough. Uh, in analyzing PROC slab info, the ma major contributors to usage were XFS inode at 39 gigs and dentry at 4 gigs. So this indicated two paths. The first was we could increase VFS cache pressure to preference dropping dentry and inodes when reclaim takes place. And the second was to force the reclaim of that memory. Um, so, if, so yeah, so that's basically what we implemented in, in this scenario. Um, yeah, kind of similar to the previous one. So further investigation of this uh, issue led to the identification of the root cause where Swift was unintentionally triggering an, an XFS anti-pattern whereby pending objects were written temporarily to a file in a, Swift, in a temp directory and then renamed to be moved into the Swift uh, directory hierarchy. Uh, so this led to a disproportionate number of inodes in a single XFS allocation group and that led to really poor performance. This is fixed in a later version of Swift, however, that was unavailable in this environment. So these kernel, kernel tunables were essential in being able to bring that uh, environment back to a working condition in the meantime. Uh, third case study is, uh, was a recurring issue with um, a hyperconverged node which uh, was also using huge pages. Uh, the user presented with the issues, with the following issues, uh, basically creating OpenStack instances backed by huge pages, they just frequently failed. Um, checking, you know, free memory and proc mem info, it seemed like there was ample um, resources available for uh, those allocations, or the, sorry, those instances to be um, deployed onto that infrastructure. So, have a look at it, the software stack. They had a 4.15 kernel. Um, the nodes were obviously running Nova Compute, but interestingly enough, in this scenario, uh, we were able to reproduce this problem on many nodes across the cluster. So in some ways, it implied that it wasn't really specific to the services that were running on those particular nodes. So initial investigation showed that instances were failing, or sorry, failing with uh, the follow, following error. So what's the behavior of Quemu? Basically, Quemu starts a VM process. It'll pre-allocate the memory for the instance, but it'll also allocate some memory for executive functions. So the system had ample huge pages that it was using backing uh, these instances with, but it had a shortage of higher order pages for Quemu to claim for its own use. In the hyperconverged architecture, we allocate a portion of memory that's reserved for system use. This needs to account for various applications with various usage patterns, including this allocation, which comes from the system portion, but it's required and scales with the user workload. So our initial solution had two paths. We could either increase the reserve proportion of memory, uh, portion of memory uh, which in this circumstance was kind of difficult to do because we were already reserving about 20 gig memory, uh, or the second option is to reduce the utilization of the reserve portion of memory. So drilling down with the usual tools, uh, it was noted that there was no real particular processes that were using that much memory. Uh, the largest consumer at the time was OVS and it was less than a gig. So 
There was, however, a large number of Nova API metadata processes, 161 to be precise, and together they accounted for roughly 14 gig of memory. Now, the metadata service provides a way for instances to retrieve instance-specific data by responding to the requests. The Nova API metadata application serves the metadata API and routes its requests. It's needed any time you need metadata, and a common time that you need metadata is when you're trying to boot an instance. So in a highly dynamic cloud, you might need a lot of Nova API metadata services or processes to be able to service those requests. But in a relatively static cloud, um, that's not needed so much. So in either, either way, in this case, 161 was probably overkill. So we tuned this to a more sane value via Juju configuration. And um, we also noted that the Charm's adaptive configurations uh, could be tweaked for this scenario to um, yeah, account for the infrastructure it was being deployed onto. So tuning the number of metadata services freed up a significant amount of resources uh, across the cluster, and that solved the problem for the customer. However, the problem returned a few months later, and this time there was like no significant resources, resource consumers. So investigating Proxone info yielded some inconsistencies with, uh, with calculating min, low, and high watermarks, those watermarks that we were referring to earlier. So the gap between min, low, and high is calculated with either one of the, well, the max of either one of these um, formulas which is the min free pages times the zone managed pages divided by the sum of managed page all zones, or zone managed pages times watermark scale factor divided by 10,000. On this node, which, as I mentioned, um, was allocating huge pages at boot, Proxone info showed the following. Uh, it was evident that if you took the default value of watermark scale factor and echoed it back into Proxys VM, these values would change. So how is the watermark scale factor actually calculated, or more so, like, what is the logistics of it being calculated? Um, so the first step is that uh, when the system boots, huge pages are allocated, and they're done so by at boot by the boot memory allocator. And when I say they're allocated, they're reserved, essentially. Uh, at the end of the boot stage, the boot memory allocator transfers the remaining memory, so not the huge page, re the reserved huge pages, transfers the remaining memory to the buddy allocator and populates zone managed pages. The watermark is then calculated whilst huge pages are still reserved by the boot memory allocator. Then huge pages are returned from the boot memory allocator to the huge page free list added to the zone managed pages. So because of this, the value of min, low, and high watermarks at runtime uh, will be much larger than when they're calculated as a system's booting. So ideally, at least in this case, uh, watermark calculation should be based on the memory excluding the huge pages, uh, which cannot be used by the buddy allocator. However, this would have implications for transparent huge pages and the values reported by free, so that would need to be addressed separately. In this case, in the um, case study in particular, uh, despite the mismatch, there was still evidence that compaction thresholds were not being reached before seeing page allocation failures. So to address this, we implemented the following tunings. Uh, yeah, we lifted uh, watermark scale factor and we lowered ext frag threshold, uh, which reduced the index memory of, uh, sorry, the index of memory fragmentation, which is the point at which compaction is triggered. So, how do we observe these issues? Well, we have two primary categories of tools. There, the first is tracing, which is essentially making use of event-based records. Uh, tracing tools capture data points based on the execution of an event. So application logs are a really classic example of this. There's also dynamic tracing, which involves tracing an arbitrary function in a running system, but that can be quite finicky to implement. The second option is sampling, which is where you capture a set of data points at a given point in time as a snapshot. You can then use multiple snapshots to build a profile of data points over time. So let's take a look at some specific tools. Oh, yeah. So we have PS, which provides a snapshot of process information running on a system. It's a sample of one, but it can still be highly useful. So with some shell techniques, which were highly useful in the case studies that I showed. Um, you can basically filter and sort and get a rough idea about what process, processes are using what in your system and you know, add up them, add up certain processes or even like calculate the number of different processes or 
Yeah. The only problem with PS is that short-lived processes are particularly hard to capture. So that's why you need tools like exec snoop, which can be useful at capturing uh, information of these short-lived processes by, trace by tracing the process execution rather than sampling it. Next, we have Systat, which is a sample-based tool, and it can provide a profile when daemonized or run at intervals. Uh, so for instance, we could view the memory statistics on my home server for yesterday. Um, SAR provides a really good starting point for locating issues, but it's generally, generally its granularity is sort of too lack lacking to actually capture acute problems. So for this, you'd go to a, a tool that's a bit more in depth called Perf, which is quite useful. So Perf is a sample-based tool as well, and it can generate a lot of data. It's uh, not suitable to run constantly due to the performance overheads, and uh, this would leave you with a significant amount of data to sort through when you're done, which may or may not relate to your problem. Um, if an issue is intermittent, the operator needs to be on the lookout for that problem behavior and then capture, be ready to capture that um, issue with Perf. So to assist with this, uh, there is a simple tool uh, to help capture Perf data when problems might arise. So it uses you know, simple heuristics like a spike in CPU to trigger um, uh, perf to record, start recording. Uh, yeah, perf data, data can also be useful and you can produce flame graphs with it like the one on the back of this slide. And finally, we have BPF, which can refer to a number of things. Uh, originally, it was the Berkeley packet filter implementation, um, but in modern times, it usually refers to the extended implementation in the Linux kernel. And it can also sometimes be, people can sometimes be referring to the suite of compilers, libraries, and tools that make use of BPF as well. Uh, these include the BPF compiler collection and BPF trace. So making use of BPF requires a relatively modern kernel, um, at least 4.9, however the newer the better, but in all but one of the uh, case studies I showed, we didn't actually have that available to us. Um, and so for operators, this should definitely drive the case, the business case to upgrade as soon as possible. Uh, but yeah, BPF has both sample and trace capabilities. Uh, BCC and BPF trace provide a bunch of generally useful tools. So I mentioned exec soup, snoop before, that's a BPF tool, uh, part of the BCC uh, collection. And however, the e ecosystem around BPF tooling is also quite advanced and you can just, it's actually quite straightforward to develop your own. So for our use case in sustaining engineering, um, we think that a combination of Go BPF with BPF type format looks like a really promising way to develop tools for the specific scenarios with the minimal administrative overhead that you usually get when you're trying to do K probes and similar things. Um, now I'm gonna have a look at some mechanisms of resource confinement and uh, their management interfaces. So starting, at the starting with application level controls. Um, so we had a bit of a look at Nova. Um, there, there's probably more than this, to be honest, but like two uh, particular controls that, uh, or configurables that stand out. Um, of course, the reserved host memory, uh, which signals to, the, uh, signals to Nova to reserve some portion of memory when making scheduling decisions and is essential to man maintaining some kind of partition between user workloads and system workloads. Uh, the second one is the metadata workers, which as we saw can be a, quite a drag on resources if they're overcommitted and um, they should be set appropriately for the environment. Uh, this also serves as a timely reminder that scale-related configs uh, can be quite essential and that you should probably, I suppose, check that they're appropriate for your environment. Uh, if you're using Ceph and with Bluestore, uh, Ceph OSD memory target is a really good setting to consider. It's a best effort setting, uh, but it's still ho helpful in managing co-located services. Basically, it um, sets a target for the OSD, uh, OSD processes to try and not go over. Uh, yeah, and if you're using MySQL, um, inodb buffer pool size is an interesting tunable. Um, it's actually tuned quite conservatively by default, so it's unlikely to cause you any issues by default. But if you are increasing that value to say, get some more performance out of the system, you also need to consider the impact it would have for the reserved portion of memory and um, yeah, other parts of your system. So at the next level down, you'd be looking at namespaces and C groups. 
Um, namespace is an abstraction that makes a process appear to have its own isolated instance of a resource. So some frequently encountered namespaces are the user namespace, which maps UID and GID values, the PID namespace, and a network namespace. Um, noticeably absent is a storage or device mapper namespace, which means that controlling the device mapper from inside a container can be quite tedious and fraught with danger. Um, yeah, so you can run a uh, name, you can run an application in a namespace with NS Enter, and you can also list namespaces with NSLS. Uh, the next, um, I suppose, configurable you have is cgroups. And they're essentially a method to organize processes and distribute system resources in a controlled configurable manner. Processes are organized into a tree structure, and various controllers act on nodes of this tree structure to, I suppose, impose limits or, yeah, do whatever you want. Um, yeah. And in Ubuntu, we mount cgroups to sysfs cgroup, and you can interact with it with those C groups in the example like I've put up here. So it's likely that you're probably already using namespaces in C groups uh, via another int management interface, in particular maybe systemd, maybe something else. Uh, systemd has its own, I suppose, terminology, but essentially maps to the same thing. Uh, so for systemd, a C group, uh, C groups are modeled with uh, systemd slice units, and it's a concept much the same for hierarchically managing your resources uh, of a group of processes. Systemd also has tools for managing C groups or certainly introspecting them. Uh, so there's Systemd CGLS and Systemd CGTop. And Systemd also contains a tool, Systemd nSpawn, uh, which allows you to spawn processes or turn OS trees, uh, spawn or use OS trees in a namespace. So nSpawn, systemd nSpawn coupled with systemd slices, uh, they provide the tools to manage and introspect namespaces and C groups all on their own. You may also be aware of LXC and LXD. So LXC is a user space interface to the kernel containment features and LXD is a container and virtual machine manager. And so you can create containers with LXC create or LXC launch and it'll set up the namespaces and C groups for you um, for the resulting container. Finally, when we take another step down, we have global kernel tunables. Uh, they're used to alter the behavior of the kernel at runtime and are controlled via proxys. As the case study is primarily focused on memory uh, problems, uh, we'll look at tunables in that area. Uh, the re the relative, uh, relevant tunables reside in proxys VM, where VM refers to the machine abstraction that the kernel presents to processes. We've made heavy use of two tunables today. Um, the first was min-free k-bytes, which is used to force the Linux VM to keep a minimum number of kilobytes free. This number is also used to compute the watermark values uh, for each zone in the system proportionally. This is useful as we can tune async reclaim to take place sooner, but the trade-offs are that we'll likely have a lot of unused or at least some unused memory, um, and there'll be more frequent async reclaims. The second option is watermark scale factor, which defines the amount of memory left in the system before kswap D is woken up, and how much memory is, needs to be free before kswap D goes back to sleep. This is useful as we can tune async replay, reclaim to take place sooner, uh, but the trade-offs are kind of similar to min-free k-bytes, but with less wasted memory. Uh, and it's only available since, at least in the upstream kernel, since 4.10. Uh, so that made it kind of unable to be used in many of our case study environments. So, we've covered the conceptual differences in infrastructure architecture and the key considerations for analyzing hyperconverged architecture. We've had a look at several workload case studies. We have covered the use of basic tracing and profiling tools to improve observability. And we've also covered the mechanisms available at various levels to manage the behaviors of applications within our hyperconverged architecture. As an operator, there can be a lot of work in conceiving an idea of a cloud and delivering a fully functional and efficient service. Um, as demonstrated, and this is just the tip of the iceberg, there are many paths to traverse when locating and diagnosing and fixing issues. Uh, there are many configuration choices to manage, and they go through the entire range of the application stack. So great care needs to be taken to ensure these applications coalesce with each other and use workloads in an efficient manner. So 
the OpenStack charm package, uh, uh, sorry, the OpenStack charms package the operational knowledge required to achieve this. Uh, in turn, that allevi alleviates much of the operator burden and complexity. They also provide a unique opportunity to optimize configuration for the target environment. So when we were investigating uh, these issues and considering the numerous ways that we could improve these uh, problems for our broad user base, we decided to introduce a spec and implementation to the OpenStack charms to configure watermark scale factor appropriately for the target infrastructure. In the future, we aim to make to take more of these insights and develop and push them back into the charm operator ecosystem. And uh, hopefully this should improve the performance and reliability of these systems for all our users. Uh, before I finish, I should give a brief shout out to Gavin Go, who is a senior software engineer with Sustaining Engineering, and he informed much of the kernel uh, side of this talk. Um, yeah, and uh, also there, are, if these slides are made available, um, I've got a bunch of links at the end to like helpful resources that are really good for profiling and, and looking at these sorts of things. Cool, thank you. I don't, we might have time for questions, or we might not. I don't know. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Perfect. <laughs> All right, thanks.